But um, yeah, so and now all these like all the blood work and stuff. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. We really appreciate um, you being here, and we really appreciate UPMC for hosting us. Um, I wanted to let you know uh, this is Dr. Paola Sandroni. She runs the Autonomic Lab at Mayo Clinic. She is one of the top researchers in the field of autonomic neurology. And you can't hear me. Is that better? Oh, that's definitely better. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I'll just repeat it. This is Dr. Paola Sandroni. She's the head of autonomic neurology at Mayo Clinic. She's one of the top researchers in the field of autonomic neurology. Um, Mayo pretty much wrote the book on POTS, and she's been there for a very long time and has seen a lot of patients like us. So we're hoping to get some of her insight this evening. And all day, uh, we were meeting with staff here at UPMC to talk about, um, I don't know, what did we talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stuff, but I think the most uh, interesting from the perspective of this group was the meeting with uh, the concussion clinic. Yes, um, so UPMC has a pretty well-known <laughs> concussion clinic here, and a lot of what they're doing with their concussion patients, are it's very similar to what Mayo Clinic does with their POTS patients. Um, so we had conversations with them about that, and. As I'm sure some of you know, um, some people end up with POTS and other forms of dysautonomia after a concussion. So it was a pretty good day of meetings, and Dr. Sandroni just gave a lecture to uh, a bunch of physicians and nurses here at UPMC. So we're going to do the patient program. We have her for about an hour, and then she's to leave. Um, and then I will be here for the second hour. And we can, I wanted to keep it kind of informal. Instead of feeling like a medical school lecture, we wanted to have more of a conversation with each other and with the audience. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and we can we'll try to get to everything. And we know there's a lot of content about POTS that we could never get to it in a, a two hour session, but we'll try. Um, and first we just wanted to show you a little video. I, I'm guessing some of you have seen this on our website. But this is a video we made at our conference last year and it's just a POTS. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. POTS is a syndrome that really has two criteria, but a lot of associated features. People with POTS have orthostatic intolerance, that is, they don't tolerate standing up, and they have an exaggerated orthostatic tachycardic response. Their heart rate goes up more than it should when they stand up. When you stand and gravity is displacing blood downward, your brain senses that and makes your heart beat faster, makes it beat more forcibly, and tells the blood vessels in the lower half of the body to become three times tighter than what they were before. That tightening pushes blood <coughs> upwards towards the brain. And in POTS, they're unable to either make or maintain that tightening of blood vessels. And so blood <coughs> is pulled by gravity downward. The brain, trying to compensate, will then tell the heart to beat harder and faster. And frequently, it compensates enough to prevent the person from losing consciousness, but nonetheless is unable to maintain the same levels of perfusion or blood flow to the brain <coughs> and other organs that were previously present. The problem with POTS is that it is a syndrome, meaning that it encompasses different uh, symptoms. And people do not only complain of their heart racing, but they can complain of a zillion other things. Shortness of breath, tightness of chest, lightheadedness, fibromyalgia, dizziness, malnutrition, brain fog, stomach problems, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, GI tract shutdown, headaches, random body pain, Sometimes everywhere hurts. Fainting. Heat intolerance. Blood pulling. Irritable bowel syndrome. New onset allergies. Fatigue. Tingling. I think there's about 100 more. As you see, it's almost every organ of the body that is affected by this constellation of symptoms. POTS is not an isolated syndrome. It is part of a continuum, of a spectrum of conditions that range from very mild to very severe. And the common link is the autonomic nervous system. So for this reason, we put POTS as one of the major manifestations of autonomic dysfunction, or what we also call dysautonomia. Although originally we only had a very simple set of criteria to diagnose, and now we realize that comes with a whole package, and most patients have the whole package. It gets treated in a variety of ways.
like a lot of us as physicians have our own individualized approaches, I try and look at the most important factor contributing to that person's pause. Just because someone doesn't look sick doesn't mean they aren't sick. A lot of the patients actually look like young, healthy women. You know, I think if someone was missing a leg, I don't think anyone would question that something's happened and probably have more empathy. I think that sometimes is tougher for patients with POTS because they don't visibly look sick. How many people have POTS? In all our experiences here, we all can say that we are overwhelmed with patients who have this condition. We started to recognize the first cases of POTS around 1993. Of course, at that time, lots of doctors thought this doesn't exist. But as the time went on and on, people realized, no, this is real, and there's a diagnosis for it. And now it's undeniable. We have major centers involved, major university programs that are really in the front lines of research. <laughs> be the AV tech. <laughs> um, I probably should have introduced myself. I just started talking before because we were running a little late. Uh, my name is Lauren Stiles. I am the president and co-founder of Dysautonomy International. And um, I took an interest in autonomic disorders because I am a patient myself. Um, I was initially diagnosed with POTS and then later found out that I had POTS uh, sort of secondary to Sjogren's syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease that sometimes can cause autonomic neuropathies. So um, these are the slides that we are going to go over. And we're going to kind of do it back and forth, uh, sort of like more of a conversation. And again, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so you can uh, get us started. So we kind of like the package idea. Um, and next time, we'll put a turquoise ribbon on top of me. <laughs> and the question is, what's in the package, obviously? Lots of stuff, all the various symptoms that in the video, again, patient complain of, and probably more. And everyone has their own little cluster. Does it come as a surprise? No, because it's a, a global system dysfunction. So, uh, and at various times, at various days, different days, different weeks, you may realize your symptoms may vary. You may have headache today, you may have more lightheadedness tomorrow, and so forth. And so, just focusing to the single one, often time does not pay out. Again, it's not a disease, as you heard. It's a syndrome. And not everyone <coughs> has the same set of combinations. It's like, who of you makes soup here? Everyone, just about, OK. We probably have the same soup recipe. Like, if I say I'm Italian, so I like minestrone. I bet that many of you are cooking minestrone. And I bet that my recipe is slightly different than some of other of you, right? And the same for pots. Whatever you put in that pot to cook, no pun intended, still comes up a pretty nice soup. But again, you can give it a different flavor every single time. And all these symptoms, I, we can easily attribute to a variety of dysfunction at a various level of the nervous system. Now, I'll have Lauren go through this because she loves this stuff. Oh, but great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the nervous system is, the autonomic nervous system controls all the bodily function that normally you don't think about, or you're not supposed to think about, I should say. We are not supposed to control and think about our heart rate, our breathing rate, if our bowel is doing one thing or the other, except at the final product, of course. Um, and when that balance is altered, you may have a whole bunch of different problems at various levels. Lost our pointer, though, I think. Huh? Do we have a pointer here or not? I guess not. Anyway, it probably doesn't matter because then you're going to lose the microphone part. But so you can see pretty much all the internal organ there. And some may be more visible than others because, for instance, we don't have the skin there. But that's what makes you change the color, for instance, in the skin. Go ahead. So there's something on here that's just not on the slide that I'm particularly interested in. And I know um, some of, we have a couple of slides later on about uh, mast cell stuff. 
But I also think it's important for patients to know that the autonomic nervous system can actually, to some degree, regulate your immune system. So I think this is an area that we don't have a lot of great research in right now, but it's something that I think as an organization we think about. And uh, I mean, I know the doctors know about it and they've done some research on it, but it isn't something we've really studied in the POTS. So I think we need to have a couple of criteria anyway, because, okay, there is a big variety, it's a big package, but there are some certain core features that should be present in order to really attach this diagnosis. And the key feature is that you have, must have a heart rate increment of at least 30 beats per minute within the first 10 minutes of tilt. If you are under age 20, the increment should be 40. And this should happen without having a drop in blood pressure. In that case, the heart rate response will be very appropriate. But if you do not have a drop in blood pressure, that, that type of increment is inappropriate, and that's what is indicative of the dysfunction and the dysregulation and what makes you feel uncomfortable. Go ahead. Well, so I, I just wanted to maybe elaborate a little further on this, because um, on the patient support groups on Facebook and, and other online forums, we see a lot of arguments starting over whether you can have POTS and orthostatic hypotension at the same time. So I think it's really important to understand how they're different and why the doctors have separated these into two separate diagnoses. It's not to deny you a diagnosis or something like that. Um, but so some patients with POTS probably do have a drop in blood pressure a little bit when they have a tilt. But if it's to a certain degree, that's when they get the orthostatic hypotension diagnosis. And it wouldn't be, you wouldn't call it POTS um, if the patient met the orthostatic hypotension criteria, you would call it orthostatic hypotension. And, and in general, orthostatic hypotension is due to a more severe autonomic nerve problem than POTS. So you would want to distinguish. You wouldn't want to have a POTS diagnosis if you actually had orthostatic hypotension. So um, yeah, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, that would be a disservice. Basically, we see this as a pyramid, if you want to put it that way. And the orthostatic hypotension will be on top of the POTS and will override it. And the point is because the treatment for that has to be more targeted and more specific. And again, uh, say this is POTS and not orthostatic hypotension. If you truly have orthostatic hypotension, it will be a disservice to you. Yeah. <clears throat> now, sure. I was diagnosed over 17 years ago, and I was told POTS. But I have the orthostatic. I mean, I plummet to like almost nothing and black out. I've never, I've not been retested since I was the 17 years ago down in Vanderbilt. Um, I want, did they know about the orthostatic back then? Yes, yes, it yes, absolutely, up. absolutely. I think that I've, I've had conversations with Raj. You know, there used to be the diagnostic criteria has kind of morphed a little bit over time, and it used to say with or without hypotension. Yes. Raj was a big fan of that. And <laughs> so. we, we did strongly disagree. Yeah. yeah. I, I can tell you as a patient, um, I don't. We what? may need to repeat the question, otherwise oh. the video won't catch it. I'm sorry, we're going to repeat the question. So um, <coughs> someone asked, uh, she had two different tilt table tests done, and in one of the tilt table tests, uh, her heart rate went up and her blood pressure went up. In another one of the tilt table tests, her heart rate went up and her blood pressure went down. So what, and Dr. Sandroni can talk more about this, is um, tilt testing can change depending on the time of day you're tested. For women, um, you can have different results at different times in the menstrual cycle. There's times where people are more orthostatic. If you're dehydrated, uh, you could maybe drop your blood pressure a little bit more. If you are if you just had a viral infection, you could drop your blood pressure more, so. Yeah, I think you have to be consistent because I wouldn't call orthostatic hypotension if I get up now and, okay, I've been running around all day, maybe I haven't drank enough, so I may pass out. Do I have orthostatic hypotension? Probably not. Probably I'm just volume contracted. But if I have a consistent pattern, every time I stand, my blood pressure drop and I faint, that's very different. So if you have labile, 
a situation that it's probably, again, as Lauren will say, a combination of things. And plus, depends how the testing was done. And we cannot really elaborate any further on that. I think it's pretty common to have different tilt results on different days. I've had five different tilt tests over the past seven years, and every single one of them has a different looking result. But still, POTS is there throughout. And again, you know, we cannot really comment here on any specific situation without having all the data, but it really needs to be done. And it, that's why it's so important to do things in a standardized fashion, otherwise the results are going to be all over the places. And what I generally also like to have is a 24-hour blood pressure and heart rate recording. That's really uh, crucial for me to see what happens over a 24-hour time, uh, various time of day, various situation, meals, exercise, etc. Because otherwise, chances are I'm going to make a big mess if I start treating shooting from my hip. So an, another part of the diagnostic criteria that's really important is that the patient must have chronic symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. It doesn't, if your heart rate goes up 35 BPM, but you don't feel symptoms, that's not POTS. That's just, hey, someone has a little bit of standing tachycardia. Um, it's really important that those symptoms are present before doctors make the diagnosis. Um, most of the doctors say the symptoms should be around three to six months or longer. There are a lot of temporary conditions that can cause an orthostatic tachycardia, like if you've just had a surgery or you've had a blood loss from like a car accident or a, a traumatic pregnancy or something. That isn't POTS. You know, if it goes away in a few weeks, that's not POTS. POTS is something that lasts, a, you know, a chronic condition. Um, and then the, the sort of trickiest part, I think, of the diagnostic criteria is the, you know, not caused by other obvious diseases. So I'll let you talk about that a bit. Yeah. As I, we said before, it's not a disease per se. It's a syndrome. So as every syndrome can be secondary to other things. And sometimes things may not be significant. Other times it's going to be very important to make sure that the diagnosis is not missed. Is there a, an underlying cardiac condition? Is there a thyroid disorder? Is there a anemia, particularly young women, heavy periods, low ferritin level, very common, that could be a situation. Other uh, condition, more serious, other, other autoimmune disorder. You don't want to ignore those and miss those, saying, oh, I, I have POTS, period. Um, POTS will be just the epiphenomenon. It's the tip of the iceberg, so you have to go and find the iceberg. Otherwise, well, guess what happened to the Titanic? You're going to sink too. So, and that's obviously the job of us as physicians to still check a patient out and say, okay, yes, you have POTS, fine. All right, let's make sure there is nothing else that's causing this. That's still very important to do. So patients always want to know what causes POTS. And really, we don't know. I think you can get a lot of doctors to tell you their version of what they think causes POTS, and they might sell it to you as if it's the answer. But you could get 10 POTS experts in a room, and they'd all have different ideas about what's causing POTS. We really don't know, and we need more research to really understand it better. Um, we know that there are sometimes uh, triggers that people, events in their lives that people have that um, sort of set off, seem to set off POTS. Um, about half of the time, it's, it's a viral illness. About 10% of patients, it's a concussion. Um, other physical injuries, car accidents, surgeries, even dental procedures, um, any kind of anesthesia for some patients, pregnancy, and um, onset of puberty. And so, you know, there are a lot of different things. And we can't tell you exactly how these things cause POTS, or even if they, they are actually the cause, um, but they seem to be common things that trigger it. And not everyone has this. Some people don't have any obvious trigger. They just sort of slowly developed it over time. Oh, that's okay. okay. <laughs> we'll have to look back on that a little bit later. So um, anyway, there are a lot of associated conditions which doesn't necessarily mean um, they're causative or we don't know yet. They are, again, they go together. And sometimes there could be a true uh, pathology underlying it. That's why, you know, we're back to the concept. Let's make sure you're not missing something responsible for it, more specific. Joint hypermobility, uh, ehlers danlos syndrome, there are various subtypes, uh, or even if you don't have a formal diagnosis, but seems to be 
fairly common. Um, autoimmune diseases, there are a variety of them, and up to 20% of the patients seems to have something like this. Mast cell activation disorder, it's a big question mark, um, is something that has been recognized a little bit more recently. Uh, testing may not be always as easy. Um, and a lot of patients may have symptoms that look like mast cell activation, but it's not true mast cell activation. Uh, so still a lot of work to do in that. There is possibly a genetic predisposition. There is only one gene specifically reported that can actually cause POT. It's super rare. There is only one family reported. Um, and more likely than not, you have a certain substrate. And uh, uh, then something happens, again, any of the trigger that we talked before, and it's like when you blow a fuse in your house. In the house, you go, you change the fuse, or if you're like me, you just put, push the reset button, and hopefully everything goes back up when you turn the, the button back up. In the body, we don't have a reset button, and uh, the body basically goes in overdrive, and so then requires a lot of work to reset it. Um, there is a high coexistence of anxiety and hypervigilance. Um, and that may not, again, is not the cause of POTS, may actually sometimes be a consequence of it, but again, indicates a tendency of the system to go in overdrive, to be uh, very sensitive, very susceptible. Essentially, you have probably an electrical system that's a little bit more fragile and um, can be perturbed <coughs> with situation that normally shouldn't perturb it. And deconditioning is also very, very common. Um, is that the cause, is that the consequence, is, again, is it the chicken or is it the egg? We know for sure that if I put somebody on bed rest because they had abdominal surgery, they had pelvic fracture, whatever, uh, they're bed ridden for two weeks, if I test them after two weeks, they will have what looks like POTS. And it's not POTS, again. It's a secondary to all that. And that's why we're so aggressive in targeting that when we we're gonna talk about management. Yeah. I know like as a patient, if somebody had showed me this slide that said, you know, anxiety and hypervigilance and deconditioning were common a few years ago when I first got diagnosed, I'd probably been really annoyed. Be like, I'm not anxious and I'm not deconditioned, you know? And I think that um, as I've worked with our patient community for a long time, and, and I've had this for seven years now, I see this and I don't think like this is why you have POTS, but I think having POTS ha or having any chronic illness, um, especially one that it's, where it's hard to find medical help, it's hard to find a doctor to help you. You know, uh, you probably look normal, so your friends and family may kind of not really understand what you're going through. You might have trouble in school or at work because you can't function the way that you used to. I think that all kind of piles on these patients, myself included, um, and sort of makes, uh, you know, maybe makes you a little more prone to um, anxiety or just sort of like the emotional burden of your illness. And the deconditioning, if you, if you have trouble walking, of course you have trouble exercising, and of course over time you're gonna become deconditioned unless you were really intentionally uh, sort of working your butt off to avoid it. I know myself, <coughs> I have to work out um, several days a week, and if I skip, you know, if I skip a week or two, I slide back into deconditioning state pretty easily. I don't know why, I wish we knew that why that happens, but I think a lot of patients have that. So when you hear this, like try not to get angry about it. It's not patient blaming, it's saying we see this and when it is present, we just need to address it as part of the bigger picture of POTS. Sure. Can um, diet dysfunction cause POTS? No, I wouldn't call it POTS. See, I wouldn't. See, we're back to the issue. At that point, you have a structural, um, no, shouldn't say necessarily structural, but you clearly have a documented cardiac failure situation. I really think you, we're gonna sure change you if you call it POTS, because it needs to be managed in a very different way, and so the approaches could be counterproductive. Now, we used to hear a lot about the subtypes, and I wanted to uh, dispel a little bit this myth, myth a minute. Not that these things don't exist. These have helped us to understand how this ends up in happening. 
um, and give us some understanding of the pathology, uh, the pathophysiologic mechanism of it. But most patients do not have one subtype. They are not mutually exclusive, and more often than not, we are in a soup situation. We're not in the clean sashimi uh, version of it. We are soup. We just need to like meditate on that. <laughs> well, I'm a foodie, so um, you know, I always like uh, food uh, analogies because I think I find it easy to understand. Um, anyway, the main types that people talk about are the neurogenic. What does that mean? In plain English, the bl your blood vessels do not constrict properly. Hyperadrenergic, too much norepinephrine going around the system, which translates the same sensation as if you drink a whole pot of coffee. Uh, hypovolemic, there is not enough blood or not enough plasma, not enough fluid within the vessels. Doesn't matter if they extravasate out. That is not good. I have to stay within the blood vessels. Or you may have a central uh, network problem. Um, and that's really where the messages get screwed up. So, so um, when I'm going to the dentist, they can't use the regular Novocaine stuff on me if I pass out. Um, is that true? Okay, the question is, when I go to the dentist, I cannot use the usual lidocaine injection because I pass out. Um, there is a very small amount of an epinephrine in the um, topical anesthetic that the um, dentist and other use. Rarely is a big issue for some people that are very sensitive that even that small amount of epinephrine that's done by the way to prevent the anesthetic to float around your system and stay where you want the, the body to be numbed. So the only thing you can ask is to see if they can give it to you without the, uh, the epinephrine. That, that's what I get, but is, is that related? Yep. To yep. <laughs> Some, some patients just seem more sensitive to it. There's actually a subset, uh, probably a pretty small subset of uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome patients who are not responsive to uh, cane drugs like lidocaine and novocaine. And this has been uh, written about by some of the researchers in the UK. So um, if, you're t if you're hanging out on the patient support groups, you see people kind of self-segmenting, like, well, I have hyperagenergic POTS, and I have hypovolemic POTS, and you know, people kind of define themselves by um, maybe maybe they did get some testing that found some small fiber neuropathy or that they had low blood volume. And it's unless you've had every single test for every single one of these, which most people haven't because these tests are not routinely done, they're usually done for research, um, you really can't tell us what you have and don't have because you probably have a little bit of everything or, or possibly have a little bit of everything. So this is what the subtypes really look like. It's a I guess this is a big pot of soup, <laughs> but it's a very messy Venn diagram. <laughs> um, and you know, there are other things going on in POTS that, that we don't have subtype labels for yet. Um, one of the prior slides mentioned uh, genetic and epigenetics. So there is this one gene that has been identified in a, one family, and you know, lots and lots and lots of other people with POTS were tested for this gene, and nobody else had it, so it's considered like a private mutation just that that family had. But there's some pretty cool research coming out um, from the Baker uh, IDI group in Australia, finding that a subset of POTS patients have an epigenetic problem at the same gene. So epigenetics is not the gene itself having a mutation, but the way that your, uh, your body sort of transcribes the gene and makes the protein uh, that then uh, works on your autonomic nerves. So, there's a possibility um, that a, a subset of POTS patients have this epigenetic problem, and it might f uh, probably overlap with the hyperagenergic uh, classification. So we have a pretty big study that's going to happen at the Dysautonomy International Conference this year where we're going to look at the epigenetics in POTS patients. Um, and we're probably next week going to kick off a big online fundraiser to try to uh, pay for the research, because it's not cheap. So. Does it matter to get your subtyping and to get your um, uh, all the comorbidities worked up and all that? So, but from my standpoint, no. Except in some selective cases, really there is one factor that seems to be really dominant, and so we target the patient accordingly. Um, the only thing is, if there is an associated autoimmune form, then that can be reversed more quickly, and so sometimes we do target that in a more specific manner. 
So I'm, I'm not the autonomic neurologist, but I disagree. <laughs> but I don't think every patient needs a million dollar workup. I think you could drive yourself absolutely crazy trying to go to every autonomic lab and get all these different tests. And I just think that um, I wish that there was a better algorithm for our doctors to follow. Not everybody gets to go to the Mayo Clinic where I, I trust that if I've seen Dr. Sandroni, she did what needed to be done. But if you're going to the local hometown cardiologist, he probably doesn't know to think about small fiber neuropathy or EDS or autoimmunity. So what I, what I want to see happen is some kind of guidance document written for the local hometown doctor who's trying to help us manage our illness. So in the meanwhile, you know, I think as a patient, you don't drive yourself crazy, you know, making appointments all over the country, seeing a zillion different specialists trying to get worked up for every weird disease because a lot of people have POTS that's truly idiopathic. It's just POTS because we haven't figured out what it is yet. Um, and there's a subset who have EDS, who have autoimmune stuff. And um, you know, to the extent that you, I think finding the small fiber neuropathy can be helpful because if you do have that, uh, you probably want a more in-depth autoimmune workup. But that's just my opinion. I'm not the, the guru. <laughs> well, again, it depends at the point if you're looking for an alternative diagnosis or for a other condition that can explain the POTS. That's what basically the goal of the workup is. It's not to diagnose POTS. It's really what I do not want to miss right. if I do not test. That's the goal. So I want to have that clear. And I think I see patients on the support groups where they're desperately trying to get appointments with um, Mayo or Dr. Grubb or Vanderbilt and hoping that there's going to be this like magic answer once they get there. And it can be, I think it's important to have realistic expectations. These doctors are great, but they're not miracle workers. <laughs> um, and you can't not treat yourself for POTS, what we know about in POTS, while you're waiting to find some other answer. So you, everybody who has POTS has the same basic treatment, whether you have EDS and POTS or autoimmune and POTS or <coughs> post-viral POTS, you know, we all need the salt, the fluid, the exercise, uh, stress management, that kind of basic stuff is the same for everyone. So don't, what I'm just saying is don't put that off while you're looking for the underlying cause. So we, we thought we'd have a little bit of fun with you guys. <laughs> um, my very poor graphics editing skills came in here. <laughs> but um, we thought we'd do Mythbusters, because I, I think a something that kind of would be great if our patient community was more on the same page about what we're all dealing with. Um, because I see a lot of stuff on the support groups where there's a lot of false information being spread by other patients. And it's well-intentioned. They're not like trying to spread false info, but they've been given bad info by their doctors. Or they haven't been given any info by their doctors, and they've kind of just found some stuff online and decided that was the facts. So we're going to try to go through. Uh, as many of these as we can, and your job is to keep an eye on the time. I don't know okay. how much longer yeah, we have. Work so all teenagers grow out of POTS. How many of you were told this if you were an adolescent POTS patient? Like, everyone grows out of it. <laughs> yes. So some people do seem to grow out of it, but not everyone <coughs> grows out of it. Um, do you want to go over what this is your? Yep. So um, in reality, that's what we, frankly, in good uh, faith, we thought years ago. Um, because during adolescence, you have a lot of labile uh, events, uh, you, the growth, uh, the hormonal changes, so it seems to make sense. Uh, you can adjust it when things get a little bit more quiet. Um, it's sort of the opposite of what happens during menopause, right? Yeah, sort of kind of makes sense. Um, then we're realizing things are not so easy. So um, about half of the patient, essentially the symptoms persist in their ad adulthood. Uh, they may manage better, they may uh, function better, but the reality is the condition persists. Only about 20% really have a complete full resolution. Um, and uh, then there is a smaller group in which the symptoms um, persist and worsen. And a good 15%, the symptoms kind of have an undulating course um, over time with the relapsing remitting uh, profile. Um, so they have good times, bad times, and I'm not talking a good day, a bad day, we're talking weeks, months, that they're doing well and then poof, something happened, they relapse and keep going that way. So for practical purposes, the myth is busted. 
But there is, you know, to be hopeful, you know, especially when you're dealing with young kids, nobody wants to tell a young kid, sorry, you're going to have this for a really long time. You know, 86% of the patients in that study did have some improvement. So if you're newly diagnosed, you know, you're probably going to get some improvement through better management of your condition and educating yourself about what your various uh, triggers are, things that make you feel worse. So here's one that really annoys me. People telling me on Facebook that I have a friend who died from POTS. And no, they don't. They say this, and their friend either didn't have POTS, maybe was misdiagnosed with POTS, or just you know rumors being spread. Um, it's really important if our patient community wants to be taken seriously by doctors, which I think we can all agree, we have a hard time getting doctors to take us seriously as it is. We have to be accurate, and we have to talk about our illness in a way that makes us sound like credible people. So, um, well, I kind of jumped ahead, but yeah, this, this myth is busted. You can bust it. And I, when I say this on support groups, like POTS isn't fatal, the same questions, I mean, I think it's natural to ask the question because you feel like you're dying. It's such an awful feeling to feel like this. Um, and you have so many symptoms. But the patients who always want to say, well, where do you have it? Where's the research that proves it? So there really is no research that proves it. There's 30 years of clinical experience of doctors like Dr. Sandroni and others who see these patients. So well, I'm sure some of these patients have died, but something else happened. They had a car accident, they had cancer, whatever. Having POTS does not protect you from bullets or <laughs> and other awesome. diseases. <laughs> so um, people die like everyone else. I mean, sad as is, of course, particularly young patient population, but you do not die of POTS. Unless it was misdiagnosed, it was a cardiac condition, was we'll CHF or something. So no, this is busted. Yes. Okay, you can go to the next one. So this one appears in the media a lot. Um, you know, POTS is a teenage condition, and and I do think sometimes it shows up in the media more with kids because kids are cute and they're better subjects for a newspaper article. The, the reporters are like, oh, do you have any young cute kids for this story? <laughs> So um, that sort of gets out there probably because of the media. And there are some doctors who think this, too. Um, we did this um, big POTS study. I don't know how many of you may have enrolled in it. Um, it was an online survey that Dysautonomy International did with Vanderbilt. We had about 5,000 patients enrolled so far. And we asked people, regardless of when you were diagnosed, when did your POTS symptoms begin? And the peak age of onset was 14 years old. Um, about half of the patients developed symptoms in um, after age of 18, so sort of in adulthood. And we know that some of the teens still continue to have POTS as adults. So in, in theory, you know, um, the majority of people who live with POTS are, are over 18 years old. This was um, not the big POTS study with Vanderbilt. This was a prior Dysautonomy International survey of about 700 patients. And you can see the peak age of onset around 13, 14. And then there's a wide um, spread throughout the other ages. So busted. <laughs> OK. Next, some people fully recovered from POTS. And I think by now you can know the answer. Yes, confirmed. This, we just include this one because there are you know, patients on the support groups. And you remember, when you're on a support group online, these are patients who tend to be sicker. If you're feeling awesome and you're off at college and you're running around chasing after your three kids, you probably don't have time to hang out on Facebook. You're, you know, you know maybe not that you're better, but you're functioning better. Um, and that's not to say everyone on Facebook is dreadfully ill, but it's a skewed view of what POTS is. Because there's plenty of patients who have, were on there when they were really ill, who over time um, maybe aren't on it anymore. Because like we have, one young woman who was a college-age POTS patient when we met her. She was getting IV saline. She was really sick. And now she's having a baby and just got her PhD. So she's not hanging out on Facebook. She's too busy. <laughs> but um, so just when you talk just, to other yeah, patients, be, you know, people do that. recover. OK. So this is another one we see. People say, well, not if you have EDS. You can't get better if you have EDS, because EDS is permanent. So EDS um, does seem to be permanent, you know, once you have it. Um, but we know of POTS patients with EDS who recovered from POTS, you know. So it's sort of um, hard to figure out why they had POTS. If, if the EDS didn't go away and the POTS did, maybe the EDS wasn't the direct cause of the POTS. Maybe it was just a risk factor. 
I think we're not sure. So we've busted that one. Um, do you want to add anything to that? No, the only thing about EDS story is simply the only difference, I would say, if there is true bona fide documented EDS can make a little bit of difference in the type of exercise um, so that because obviously people will dislocate more easily. So it requires a little bit more supervision regarding the exercise type. That's yeah. the only thing. We have a study coming out with um, Dysautonomia International and Vanderbilt next month. Uh, Dr. Raj is presenting the data at the Heart Rhythm Society. So we looked at a whole bunch of different symptoms in POTS patients, and we divided the patients into POTS with EDS and POTS without EDS to see like what's the same and what's different. And I think you guys will be surprised. I can't reveal the secret, but it's pretty much everything was the same, um, which we were sort of surprised. I guess some, some people weren't surprised, some people were, but there were, there were one or two symptoms that were a little bit different between the groups. So we'll share that on our Facebook page once Dr. Raj presents it at the conference. So this is one that um, you can probably address this one. This one periodically comes up. All patients, hyperdrenergic or not, should avoid salt and fluid or IV saline. Well, um, no. I mean, everyone needs fluid and salt. Do everyone needs IV saline? No, not at all. Certainly not regularly. That's strongly discouraged. Makes no sense physiologically and is actually counterproductive except if you have an intercurrent illness and so you, um, let's say, have a lot of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you cannot keep up with your fluid intake, then that's a role for IV saline, not otherwise. So I just, uh, I wanted to add to this and you can see where I'm going and then f uh, fill in. Some of the people who have uh, a hyperadrenergic presentation have hypovolemia. This is t like this is what we were talking before about the subtypes aren't unique. Sometimes they overlap. So um, patients, it might be easier to diagnose a patient with a hyperadrenergic problem because it, it's kind of obvious they're more trembly and maybe their blood pressure spikes sometimes. Um, and maybe they've had the norepinephrine testing to, to confirm an actual hyperadrenergic problem. But sometimes they, they release more norepinephrine because they're hypovolemic. So if you're not addressing the hypovolemia, you're not going to be able to address the hyperadrenergic problem. That's why pretty much I said before, the different subtype, from my standpoint, doesn't matter because everyone gets the same recommendation pretty much. So. Another question. So over time, do you see, is there any pattern with what you're seeing with POTS where someone starts out in their teens as having low blood pressure and then as they age it goes high? It feels like we see that a lot, just talking to patients that have it, where it changes from one to the other with blood pressure, not necessarily, necessarily hyperadrenergic. So the question is, can patient over time evolve uh, in their profile a little bit? So from a more flavor of one subtype to a, sub, a flavor more of another subtype, absolutely. Because as we said before, it is not a pure um, cause one or the other. It's always a combo. And at different times, the body changes, life changes, life happens and one component may become more prevalent or more dominant. And that's why when we teach folks, we like to, for everyone to identify which are, which are the main driving forces. Some people realize there's certain trigger or certain shortcomings. So if they fall behind with the fluid one day, for instance, could be more problematic than another patient. Yeah. I've had conversations with Dr. Goodman at uh, Mayo's um, Arizona campus recently about um, this sort of change. We were specifically talking about post-concussive POTS patients, and he said they start out on the more uh, not full orthostatic hypotension, but on the more hypotensive side of POTS, and then over time they kind of morph into, if, if they don't resolve their POTS, you know, they morph into a more hypertensive POTS, and that's actually been my own experience too. Well, the other thing is some of this has becomes lifestyle and medication induced because we tell you to put so much salt in it that eventually you're going to develop a little bit of hypertension. So another myth we see on the patient support groups, um, there are, you know, there's quite an overlap between POTS and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and there's a, 
thinking in the CFS community that exercise, you know, you can't exercise, it's going to make you worse, it's going to make you feel worse. And so when people have POTS and their doctors are recommending exercise, but they also have CFS, sometimes they say, well, I, you know, I don't know what to do because I have both. What should I do? So um, we've talked to a bunch of the POTS experts about this, and they all said, you know, exercise, even if you have CFS. And, and some of them would even say, why would you give someone a CFS diagnosis when they meet the more sub uh, CFS is still a subjective diagnostic criteria based mostly on how a patient is feeling and what they're reporting and their symptoms, whereas POTS has an objective criteria on the tilt table. So, um, you know, if you, if you have CFS and POTS, um, you still need to do your exercises. Okay, boss, you're trying to go faster because you have to get to dinner. Keep going. I have a question. Sure. In regards to um, CFS and POTS and tilt table tests, um, the tilt table test should be, what, five, ten minutes to see if the symptoms occur? Ten minutes. Ten I minutes heard. is the minimum for a tilt study. But I heard if you have CFS, then it can take longer for those symptoms to show up. All right, so the question is, should the patient with chronic fatigue syndrome have a more prolonged tilt of 30 minutes or so? There's a lot of debate. Tilt so prolonged become very um, sensitive but very nonspecific. If I keep anyone up immobile for 30 minutes, there is a very good chance a lot of folks will develop symptoms. Um, we are more interested in doing that actually for folks that have a delayed orthostatic hypotension, not POTS. POTS by definition, within three, four minutes of standing, the, the heart rate should fulfill the criteria. So the next one is quick. I'm, I'm guessing if you're here, you probably know the answer to it. POTS is not a rare disease. Not only is it not a disease, it's a syndrome. It's definitely not rare. Um, the estimates are r very rough estimates um, that it may be one to three million patients. Um, uh, Mayo Pediatrics estimated one out of 100 teens may develop this before adulthood. So just for comparison, when you're talking to other people and raising awareness, which I know you're all doing, um, MS impacts about 400,000 Americans. So POTS is impacting more people than multiple sclerosis. I think about the resources available to the MS community. If you know someone who has MS, the MS Society and many other MS-related nonprofits really have resources in almost every county in the country. Um, so we, if we have 1 million, 2 million, 3 million patients, we should be able to have those resources for the dysautonomia community. But the MS Society has existed for 50 years, and they raise millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. So Dysautonomia International started five years ago. We've got a long way to go before we can catch up. But I do think someday that that could be a possibility, that we really could have that local level resources for everyone. Yeah, totally. Um, and of course, it's easier to um, get sympathy, for lack of a better term, if you have MS or if you have kids with cancer than if you have POTS. And by all means, those are certainly much more um, serious conditions. But as we said before, the impact on quality of life and function is substantial. So the burden on society and on the family, financial, emotional, um, et cetera, it's not trivial. So we definitely need to have more awareness on that. This one drives me bonkers on the support groups. There is a cure, but your doctor doesn't want you to know because your doctor is getting rich off of you having POTS. Not true. Okay? So of course, this is clear now. And let me just say one thing. Yes, I think a lot of folks have it. We're always against the big pharma. They make the big bucks. The drugs are very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. They're all bad people. That's not true. Let's be honest. We have very ethical pharmaceutical companies. They invest a lot of money to develop a drug. And sometimes a drug, at the end of a lot of money invested, turns out that doesn't work very well, or they have a lot, a lot of side effects, and so they invested millions and goes in the tank. Um, no, there is no secret weapon to cure POTS, at least at this time. And, and really, the funny thing is, Big Pharma is not interested in POTS. And as an organization, we are trying to get pharma com companies interested in POTS and other forms of dysautonomia because they fund research, you know? And uh, I think most people in this room would be thrilled if there was another 
pharmaceutical option that might actually work better than what we have. So we're trying to get big pharma interested in POTS. They're not interested. They don't even know what it is. So there's no like vast conspiracy keeping you from uh, having the magic cure. OK. So if you have POTS and mast cell activation syndrome, which is mast cell activation disorder, anyway, uh, the mast cell activation is the cause of your POTS. So I wanted to ask, by a show of hands, if you want to share, how many of you are patients who have a mast cell activation syndrome component, or you think you do, even if you haven't been diagnosed. And I'm raising my hand because I'm the queen of the allergy shots. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a couple people in here. This is like a really um, kind of new idea and not really well understood, but it's very, um, well, I'll let you read it. Well, the, again, the body doesn't work in separate compartments, and we needed to make sure that we understand what can be an association versus what's a cause. How many of you have migraine? Lots of hands. So is migraine a cause for your POTS? No, there are, it's associated more likely than not. Just indicates a certain predisposition. So the mast cells are part of the immune system and they are, in, at least, there is a role in the autonomic system in regulating immune system as well. We still don't know a whole lot about it. We still don't know the extent of it. We all know that when somebody's super stressed out, they're more prone to catch a cold or a flu or whatever. So we know that uh, stress <laughs> suppresses immune responses, for instance. So there is, all this is interconnected, but is not quite necessarily a cause. So this is neither hey or nay. Um, more likely than not, again, the two go hand in hand as a manifestation of the same process, but certainly feed into each other, so we put this as positive. Yeah. Um, I know some of you probably saw the genetic study that came out of NIH, um, la I think last year. Uh, they found a gene that uh, it's not actually a mutation in the gene, but it's multiple copies of the alpha tryptase gene. and they had described that some of the patients who had this duplication error of, a gene, of the alpha tryptase gene um, had uh, mast cell, EDS, and POTS. So the patients um, saw this info and said, oh, I have all three of these. I must have this gene. And it's, a, not, it's not an irrational thought, but um, the patients who have this alpha tryptase duplication error have elevated baseline tryptase, meaning when they're not having an allergic reaction, their tryptase in their blood is still very elevated. So uh, Dr. Goodman at Mayo's uh, Arizona campus has been testing a ton of POTS patients for baseline tryptase levels. And he said one out of 500 to one out of 1,000 POTS patients might actually have elevated baseline tryptase. So that genetic finding, while very interesting, um, isn't the cause of POTS EDS mast cell in every patient who has that trifecta of conditions. The cure for POTS is salt, fluid, and exercise. What do you guys think? They're going to throw eggs at us if we say that. <laughs> OK. Well, we said that there is really no cure for POTS. All the, the things that we talk about is to help patients be more functional, keep the syndrome under control, not quite cure. It's a very different concept. Can go a very long way, though. So salt, fluid, exercise are important management strategies. But for some patients, mm -hmm. these are not enough. For some patients, are. Yeah. Um, so we can just go on to bust it. I feel like we need to like do the thing that they do on the show when they bust something. Um, so POTS is only caused by deconditioning. I'm sure some of you have been told this by doctors. It's extremely frustrating when you're told this and you know that you weren't deconditioned when it started. So um, just to kind of go through it quickly, I think um, you can confirm this too. A lot yeah. of these patients are very athletic, active young people when they got sick. I was on a seven-day snowboarding trip. I was healthy as could be and um, started acutely after a concussion. So it wasn't deconditioning that caused it, but after nine months of no diagnosis or lots of misdiagnosis and being pretty much I, I wasn't necessarily bedridden, I was couch-ridden, you know, like one step above bedridden. <laughs> uh, 
um, started growing roots on the couch and I got deconditioned. Yeah, you know, and it's definitely hard to hear that um, because it sounds like the doctor's blaming you, but it's not necessarily blaming. Sometimes it's just there. So it makes POTS worse. And part of the reason why is because deconditioning um, results in low blood volume. And then it's going to be even harder to exercise because we know POTS patients have a low blood volume already sometimes. And people who are really well conditioned have a higher blood volume. And, and actually, I think that the exercise, probably the best benefit of exercise in POTS patients is to build the blood volume. It's the long-term way to build blood volume. Plus, it's the best way to slow down the heart. Yes. I mean, you can pick whatever. There are various variations of theme, but I think everyone pretty much gives the same uh, recommendation exercise-wise. And we don't tell you to go start run a marathon tomorrow, of course. It's always very gradual. That's the key. Um, but that's the goal. And you know, if you pick an athlete, their heart rate is low. Um, and their tolerance even to uh, volume depletion or whatever, it's much, much superior to any of, of us sitting here. So the goal is not necessarily to bring people to an Olympic level by any means, but, well, if you do, terrific. We'll take credit. Um, but it's really to bring you to a point where you can function and not worsen the situation by, uh, again, causing all these secondary changes. When um, Dr. Raj from Vanderbilt talks about the exercise protocol, pretty much all of the POTS doctors give this, a similar type of exercise plan. Um, and he, sa he says, you know, I tell my patients when they're about to start this, like, it's going to make you feel worse. If, you know, if you've been sick for a while and you start exercising, even a healthy person that doesn't exercise, when they start exercising, they're going to feel worse. You might even have a flare of your POTS symptoms. And you know, you re it's just the consistency that's really important. I think um, for me, I had to start, I did the, um, the Dallas protocol and I had to start slower than the first week that they had because I was pretty much bedridden. Um, and now that I'm sort of beyond, like I finished all, with all that and I just, I think you have to find what works for you. You know, what do you enjoy doing? Because if you're gonna have to do it three or four days a week for the rest of your life or for a really long time, it better be something you want to do um, and, and really um, doing finding that right level of exercise like it doesn't totally wipe you out but still gives you the uh, the exercise benefit that you need yeah oh someone on Facebook asked us to to bust the Smith so she could show it to her doctor so <laughs> look at the camera whatever doctor is watching this um, so POTS is not just orthostatic symptoms. POTS comes with a lot of symptoms that can happen laying down, and uh, it's, you know, it's a syndrome, so there are a whole bunch of symptoms associated. This slide is from, um, this chart is from the recent uh, presentation we did at the American Academy of Neurology. Um, there are a lot of symptoms going on. So uh, interestingly, the muscle pain and muscle weakness. So POTS patients don't really have like a motor neuropathy. So our muscle weakness is, you know, what is that? Is that more of a blood flow issue or a deconditioning issue? Or? Yeah, it's also an altered perception. It's like because of the uh, high sympathetic tone, it's like we used to use uh, the uh, analogy of the uh, overflown carburetor in the car, but now nobody has carburetors that work that way. So. But basically you're flooding the system and your system becomes choked. Um, and so that translation for your perception is not working and yeah it doesn't work very well indeed so okay so we we've busted that one this is our our last slide so do you have to go now I gotta you go. do okay so I have additional slides I'm gonna do solo um, does anybody have last minute questions we could do two or three questions before you go oh no okay maybe we should no I'm that. seeing this four hands All okay right. what are, what are the, the drugs that are available? I'm gonna get into that 
is going to go into all the treatment part. Um, I have a question about the IV uh, fluids that you had mentioned earlier. Were you saying that you, across the board, don't suggest IV fluids or just for the hydro? Not routinely. For, okay. That's the key. Okay. If it's somebody get, it can happen really to anybody really, get a bad gastroenteritis, they need IV fluid, okay, one time deal. Not regularly, every week, with a central line, no. Because Dr. Grubb had put out a, a recent study that showed that for many POTS patients, that was, they found that to be very beneficial in raising the quality of life. So you're not So his study was um, using um, about roughly a liter of saline a week or, or maybe twice a week for a period of six months or less, so not like a permanent thing and using it as a bridge to get someone exercising again. And most of the patients didn't actually stay on the saline, voluntarily stopped the saline before the six months was up because once they started exercising again, they didn't need it. So it's, I think, you know, uh, that's a very new concept. Um, Children's National in DC published a similar abstract on pediatric patients uh, last year. But I, I think there's a difference between I'm using saline temporarily to get my mojo so I can exercise, and I'm going to be on saline for the rest of my life. You know, there's the other thing that was really important that came out of the Children's National study, which never became a manuscript; it was just an abstract. Was that their their data showed that their pediatric POTS patients that had uh, pick lines and chest boards were 11 times more likely to have a blood clot than the other kids at their hospital that had pick lines and chest port, uh, chest ports and pick lines. So we don't know, we don't have enough data on that to say that holistically about POTS patients, but you know, there may be an increased risk of clots in our patient population. So. Uh, well, also anyway, having a central line is very dangerous, and so you have to weigh the pros and the cons. Okay. So we'll let you go. I'm sorry I kept you longer. No, it's okay. <laughs> So this is the question of what to do when things are not going well and you have a hard time in finding a specialist the wait list is long. Um, honestly, I'm not sure what to answer to that. Um, we have specialists across the country. I think more and more people are informed now. Um, I think after today, even the doctor here are seemingly interested in taking charge of this. We do not have three years wait list right now. We have probably three months. I'm in Mayo, Rochester. So I understand it's not around the corner, but again. Cleveland Clinic generally doesn't have the three year wait list either. I think that's just grub. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Wilson or Dr. Yeager at, at Cleveland Clinic um, probably have a few months wait. Well, I, we just talked about them today. Um, they seemed interested. That's as far as I can go. So I think. Is it the cardiologist or the neurologist here at UPMC? Well, I spoke with cardio uh, with the neurology. Neurology. Okay. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sandra. Yeah, thank you for the. My slides just went off, but I have more slides. Can I just unhook something. Can you find me the AV people? Can I fill the gap? Uh, I'm just trying to get my slides hooked up. Oh, it's Well, you just want exercising with POTS and with chronic fatigue syndrome. And people with chronic fatigue syndrome, exercise that can actually go into a crash, and there's a link to that one called Coast Exertional Malaise. Right.
Right. I think that most POTS patients feel worse when they begin an exercise program, and for it could be for weeks. I mean, usually around three months is when you start to really feel the benefit. And I know when I first started exercising, I didn't do it for three months because I was like, this is insane. I feel horrible. Why am I doing this? And, you know, um, the best answer I can say is, do what you can do and keep doing it and keep adding. Like if you can do five minutes this week, then do 10 minutes next week. And if you can do 10 minutes this week, do 15 minutes next week. Just keep building up your tolerance really slowly over time. And you know, the, the data shows that this works in POTS patients. You know, this is not just something the doctors have just made up. Um, it really does help the majority of patients who actually do the program. So I'm gonna just do, let me just move into the slides because I have slides about exercise in here. Um, and these are just the, the broad brush kind of topics we want, I want to go over. Um, I wish Dr. Sandroni could have stayed for the whole thing, but she actually has another meeting with more doctors. So hopefully she's educating doctors while we're hanging out here. So the lifestyle changes, these are, I'm sorry? Oh, my slides are not up. Did it, did what? And it's showing it's open on here. <laughs> Somebody want to come do this for me? I have no idea. I don't know where the AV grid will end. I'm not tech savvy. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's okay. I can go. I can slide really quickly through a bunch. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. We busted some minutes. Oh, this is one we actually didn't really talk about before. Um, we know POTS patients who are like hardcore athletes, and they still have POTS. So the idea that exercise is like a magic cure, Probably not. Um, there are plenty of patients who exercise all the time and they still have POTS symptoms, but they live a much better quality of life because they exercise and they stick with it. This is um, one of our prior board members, Angela, who actually ran a marathon in the heat in like San Diego, which I think is crazy even for healthy people. Okay, so lifestyle changes. Um, you may be familiar with these already, but um, sometimes we have newly diagnosed patients with us and it's always good to sort of review the basics. Um, getting your salt in. Sometimes it can be, you know, daunting to try to get um, 8,000 to 10,000 milligrams of salt a day, especially if you're trying to eat healthy. You know, try not to get this from junk food. So V8 is a good source. I soy sauce, everything, or uh, Sanjay gluten-free tamari if, you're, um, if you avoid gluten. There are supplements. Uh, like Normalite and Vitassium, and I mention those because those two actually, they donate 10% of sales to Dysautonomy International from uh, those two products, which is pretty cool. It helps fund our research, and we, the products are uh, pretty good too. So um, if you use large grain sea salt, you can actually get more sodium intake without two, like it's, because it's a larger grain, you're not tasting the entire grain of salt that you're getting. So large grain salt is one way to get a little crunch factor on your salad and still um, get more salt per bite, I guess. Um, there's some foods that just taste really good with a ton of salt, like mashed potatoes and eggs, uh, soup. The soup, we kept talking about soup before. Um, using olive oil and salt, you know, the, the word salt, uh, salad comes from salt. Um, in Italy, uh, in Roman times, people used to just salt their vegetables with olive oil and salt. So. Eating like that is very helpful for POTS patients. Um, if you haven't already, probably half of you here probably have a water bottle with you. Um, just have, the more you have water around you, the more you're gonna drink. Um, a lot of people don't like plain water, kind of makes you a little nauseous sometimes, especially in the morning. So just add some flavoring to it just to kind of be able to get it down. Um, coconut water, some people like that. Uh, fruit juice, if it's really sugary, um, is probably going to actually long term would dehydrate you if you drank like a ton of orange juice or something. So mix it with seltzer or water if you're drinking a lot of it. Um, maple water, I don't know if you guys have tried this. It's like a new trendy thing in Whole Foods. It's kind of expensive, but it's really good. <laughs> 
It comes, it's just the water from a maple tree. Um, generally, you want to skip dehydrating liquids. I mean, I'm sure some of you probably drink coffee and tea, regular tea. But this actually, um, long term, will actually dehydrate you, even though you're drinking fluids when you drink it. Soup counts as fluids. There's more soup references <coughs> everywhere here. Um, and then there are a lot of foods that are actually very high water content. So especially in the summer, it's nice to have these um, refreshing types of, uh, you know, watermelon. And um, a lot of patients, you know, because they have a heat intolerance in the summer, you can actually make ice pops out of some of these fruits and juices and stuff. And it's, it's helpful to get your fluids that way too. So exercise, you want to have um, 30 minutes four to five times a week. If you're not currently doing that, it seems like, oh my god, that's impossible. I can barely walk to the kitchen. How am I going to be exercising this much? And I can tell you, I was there. I've been there. I know how impossible that seems. So stop thinking about exercise like a sweaty Jane Fonda workout or some you know, muscle pumping kind of iron lifting thing. Like Just think of it as moving your body whatever you're doing. Um, I remember when I was pretty much bedridden, like I started out um, just writing my name with my toes in the air, like laying in bed, like just writing, writing the alphabet, writing my name, just getting my leg muscles moving. And it was really hard to get through the whole alphabet in the beginning. And then after a few days of doing it, I could, I could do it. And then, you know, then I was doing more um, walking and sitting up and whatnot. Just start wherever you are and just slowly kind of work your way into it. Um, we say slow and low because the exercises that are not standing up exercises work better for us. Recumbent biking, rowing, swimming. If you do, if you are a fainter, it's probably a good idea to have someone with you in the water to make sure. Uh, but generally, people generally don't faint in the water that much because the water acts like a giant compression stocking to help you uh, stay upright. Floor strengthening and toning, things like Pilates or yoga on the floor. If you have EDS, you have to be careful. Protecting your joints is something you're going to have to learn how to do. Um, and usually, the, if you don't know already how to do this, you would want to see a physical therapist who has some experience with EDS patients. And usually, other patients are the best ones to tell you who that is in the area. Um, uh, we have a sample exercise plan on uh, the Dysautonomy International website from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and it's meant for peds and adults, and it's based on the Dallas protocol, but it's a little bit more modified that's a little um, easier to do with more explaining about like why we're doing this. So diet is something we don't really see talked about in the research literature, but we certainly hear the patients talking about it on various support groups, um, things that they've tried. and. There's no like answer for like what your diet should be if you have POTS, but some people feel better when they try gluten-free. Some people feel better when they're dairy-free. Low FODMAPs is a, a certain type of uh, diet, which you can uh, Google and find out what it is. Um, lots of leafy greens and brassicas, which are like um, uh, broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. And there's actually um, a reason that this might be helping. The epigenetic research I was talking about out of Australia found that POTS patients, or, uh, some, some POTS patients, not everyone, have um, uh, a molecule called HDAC that's binding to their, uh, their <coughs> RNA and is making them not make as, as much norepinephrine transporter protein as they should have. And they don't have enough NET protein their norepinephrine leaks from their nerves into their blood vessels and gives them this hyperagenergic kind of state. So there are prior research articles on natural foods that just have an anti-HDAC property. Broccoli on the top of the list, so eat your vegetables. <laughs> you might, uh, we don't have any research proving this, but there is prior research showing that broccoli and uh, Brussels sprouts and spinach have high levels of uh, anti-HDAC compounds. And if HDAC might be playing a role in POTS, can't hurt to eat your broccoli. Um, eating more veg and lean protein and whole grains, avoiding junk. A lot of POTS patients feel worse with high carb diets. If you eat some really sugary stuff and you haven't had any protein with it, um, there's you know a tendency toward, towards not feeling so great after that. Um, some people, their blood pressure drops after they eat, or they just feel more symptomatic, even if their blood pressure stays the same. You can eat smaller meals more often. 
and um, more protein, less carbs. Uh, eating foods with omega-3s um, has actually, there's some research in other diseases showing that um, a lot of omega-3s um, can improve your autonomic nervous system tone, can improve the way your vagus nerve works. So um, it's easy enough to do, just eat, you know, try eating healthier uh, to the extent that you can. Um, sleep is a really important thing in, in POTS. The worse your sleep is, the worse your quality of life is. And we have really good data on this from Vanderbilt. The, the sleep line kind of followed the quality of life really um, well. So if you're not getting good sleep and you've done everything you can do at home to try to get good sleep, definitely talk to your doctors about it because you could get a, a sleep study test done, uh, maybe meet with a sleep disorder specialist to try to work on you know, why you're having trouble sleeping. Somebody has a question? Yeah. That's where we're at. Like, what, what do you do? I think that there are a lot of um, basic tips that, like, these types of things work for most people. And then there's always someone who has a more complex version of a sleep problem that is not something that I can address as a, you know, in this lecture. But I would say if you're not feeling like your doctors are helping you address a problem that's a serious problem, you know, pursue a second opinion, pursue a third opinion. It's very frustrating to have to do that, and you don't want to bounce to too many doctors, but um, I think that there are, there's a million ways to treat everything, you know, and it, it's, it's very much up to the doctor to kind of come up with something that, that you could try, and I know it's frustrating. I mean, I have symptoms, too, that don't respond to the normal treatment protocol, but... And I mean, obviously, that's a pretty normal thing. For yeah. 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 So I'm thinking the sleep thing is the, the sleep thing is big, but there's also studies showing that we basically have, uh, for the most part, that POTS patients have a pretty normal uh, sleep pattern. But you don't, you wouldn't think that if you are on the support groups. There's a lot of people talking about sleep problems, and there's a lot of people on there at 4 a.m. <laughs> and I'm usually one of them. <laughs> so somebody over here had a question. Actually, I don't have a question. Are you from this area? Me? Yes. We live near Johnstown. Okay, you should get in touch with a Dr. Thomas Rice here. He's actually a pulmonologist. I know that seems strange, but he does a lot of stuff with sleep study um, and all of that. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Oh no, I didn't. Oh, I thought you said um, UPMC. Yeah. We'll take one last question, then I'm going to move on after the next topic. Um, there's also around here. Another trick that um, some patients use is a lot of us feel worse after a warm shower. We get more uh, lightheaded and dizzy and fatigued feeling. Use your weird pot stuff to your advantage. Take a shower before bed, get exhausted, and then fall asleep. Um, sometimes, you know, taking the normal uh, 7 a.m. shower before work or school is kind of hard for us. So I, I tend to uh, take a shower at night for that reason. Um, 
medical compression stockings, a lot of people, um, I'll get to you in a second, I just wanna. So a lot of people don't like them because they're uncomfortable, they're hard to get on. But if you wear full length medical compression stockings of 20 to 30 millimeter compression or more, these are prescription strength, um, they really, really do help, especially um, the abdominal area is where they're really important. POTS patients, some of us pull in our legs, but more of us pull in our gut area and our sort of, our sort of chest to knee is, is the most area. So if you, if you really can't wear compression stockings, um, a good abdominal binder or some Spanx. Um, I know the guys are like, no. But, <laughs> but um, the Spanx are helpful. Um, and, in, and for men, they have sort of athletic compression gear now at uh, some of those stores. Um, if you put it on early in the morning, it's going to have the best effect because the longer you're upright, the more you are blood pooling during the day and you're um, missing some of the advantage that the stockings can give you. And don't sleep with them on unless you like having numb legs. Learned from experience. <laughs> um, so temperature control is an issue, especially in the summer, we're getting too hot. So there's cooling vests and neck wraps and wrist wraps, um, little personal fan spritzer. Um, ice pops you can never have too many of. Now I think some patients are also in the summer, um, the air conditioning really bothers us because to go from like a warm environment outside to suddenly like in a cold air conditioned room um, is also annoying and, and like it's a, it's a harmless symptom that it's really um, makes you uncomfortable and not be able to focus on whatever you're in the room for. So dress in layers, you know, some people wear the fingerless gloves or have hot packs with them even in the summer. Um, Coping skills. I think this is the stuff that the doctors are not really good at talking to us about um, because <coughs> they don't really know what to say. <laughs> but I think as patients, we need to sort of be proactive in, in figuring out ways to cope. How do you live the best life that you can live with whatever your circumstance and your situation is? So pacing yourself. Uh, when we did the big pot survey, we asked patients, like about 5,000 patients, we said to them, what is your best weapon against POTS, whether it's a medication or salt and fluids or exercise and whatever. Pacing, learning to pace myself was actually one of the most common answers. People filled it in. It wasn't even like an option. They just said it. So this is, it's something that takes time. It's not something you learn right away and it's a lot of trial and error as so many things are with POTS. Uh, when do I rest? When do I push myself? Um, and, you, you know, I think POTS patients as a whole tend to be kind of a type A personality where we're push, 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 and then you get this and then like, oh my God, I can't push, you know. So you have to figure out how to balance your type A personality with your body that wants to be a type nap. <laughs> so um, planning ahead, like, like I knew I was coming here to lecture, so I kind of rested up over the weekend, although not really, I was in Boston last week and I... <laughs> overdid it there too. But I think you, you have to learn to just sort of save your, your juice up for, for bigger events, wedding, uh, sweet 16, whatever you have going on. Um, cooking meals in advance is pretty helpful. When you have the energy, do your chores. When you don't have the energy, it's less stressful then. Um, delegate chores if you can um, and do it, you know, just do what you can. I've learned to have a slightly messier house than my husband would appreciate. He's somewhere, he's somewhere here going, or a messy house. But, you know, you just do what you can. You gotta forgive yourself when you can't do everything perfect. Stress management. Um, I think that some people, when they learn about POTS, they think, oh, I'm just gonna get better and it's gonna be all uphill from here. And it's not, you know, there are a lot of ups and downs. You're gonna have a flare here and there, you're gonna, maybe have a long bad spell, um, you're gonna run into doctors that don't know how to help or don't wanna help. So just try to like let it roll off your back. Like you're not gonna die from POTS, it stinks having it, but over time you are gonna progress. You're gonna learn things that help you. Probably you yourself are your best chance of getting better. And that's a really hard thing to accept. Like wait, isn't there some doctor who's got some pill that he can give me that I can then feel a lot better? And sometimes there is, but more often than not, it's you learning to manage your symptoms and manage your illness that's really gonna help you uh, live a better quality of life. Um, I found, I went through, I think a lot of patients do, you go through like a really dark period uh, at some point in your illness where you just sort of feel like you're running out of hope and you're running out of options. 
and just you know when you go through that if you do start to get depressed like don't hide it like talk to a doctor even if you don't want to talk maybe you don't want to tell your cardiologist this because you're worried they're going to say your pox is all in your head right talk to someone else about it talk to uh, your pastor or your teacher or a therapist um, and just whatever you're dealing with don't put it aside because you have POTS and you just want to deal with the POTS. Deal with everything that, um, deal with everything you're dealing with. That's not really good advice. <laughs> just address things that come up. Um, I think a lot of patients go through, are you familiar with the um, Kubler-Ross stages of grief where patients go through um, denial that there's a problem? It's kind of hard to deny when you have POTS because <laughs> you feel it like every moment that you're awake. Um, and then uh, I, the stages are like denial and bargaining and anger and depression and then eventually acceptance. So I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in this place where they are just wishing, oh, if I could just go back to before I had POTS, you know, my life would be so great. And you can't go back. So you have to just find a way to move forward with the tools that you have um, and, and just find ways to make it work, you know. I think of POTS sort of like asthma. People generally don't die from asthma, although I mean, in rare cases they do. But most people who have asthma have a disease that they're going to have to live with for a very long time. It's going to greatly impact their life and what they can do. But they find ways to make it work um, with medication, with lifestyle adjustment. So think, I think of POTS more like, like asthma than some sort of end of my life <coughs> sort of diagnosis where people sort of start to feel like there's nothing they can do. Um, so these are just two examples of people who sort of, these are actual real patients. Um, and a, one was a, a young girl named Jenny. She couldn't play in her marching band, which was like, she was like the queen of the marching band. Like she loved being in marching band. And she was really sad because she kept um, fainting. So now she, she took up something else at school. She works with the school newspaper and uh, is you know taking an interest in journalism because you can do that sitting down. Um, another young woman, uh, named Meg, she couldn't uh, commute to work anymore. And uh, you know, if you are, especially if you're single, it's really hard if you can't work and you have POTS. Um, and so she ended up finding a consulting job she could do from home, which took a lot of effort because she didn't have um, that kind of job previously. She had a job that you had to be there in person. So just you know, reinvent yourself if you have to. Um, it takes time, but you can do it. Find support. Um, we sort of talked about some of this already. Don't be afraid to reach out when you need it. Um, and remember, you're not alone. There's so many people that have POTS that are going through this and, and similar conditions, related conditions. Um, and Dysautonomy International is we always try to be a source of support for patients. Um, we have a sort of larger online POTS group, which some of you might have found. It's kind of a big unruly group because there's 20,000 people in it and you really can't um, it's hard to keep things calm and supportive when there's 20,000 people that don't know each other. But um, we're starting regional support groups in every state. So we're about to launch a Pennsylvania-based support group. I hope uh, we will send out an email to everyone who attended who was registered for this to say, you know, to welcome you if you want to join the Pennsylvania group. We have an Ohio group starting. And uh, I don't know, I think we have some people here from other states. So eventually we're going to have all 50 states, but we're just going through them uh, a few at a time. I see, let me take a question over here. Um, along those lines of what you were saying with the support system, so this particular slide show, this second one, with all these tips, they're really good. Um, are, is there any way that we're going to be able to access this like, on the website? Or? The slides? Yeah. So we're actually recording this. Um, we're going to have to edit out the part where I couldn't find my slides. <laughs> but, but we're recording this, and we'll make the slides available um, okay. with the recording. We have a Vimeo page. Um, we call it our Autonomic Disorders Video Library. It's vimeo.com slash dysautonomia. And there's like 80-something videos up there. Um, so anytime we do an event like this, we try to get it recorded and put it up. And what was, what was that Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com slash dysautonomia. Yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot of regional groups. Um, we're trying to be more organized. And um, what it came out of the 
Uh, we've been doing Dysautonomia Awareness Month events all over the country and in other countries. And in some areas, the community, the patient community, was getting so enthusiastic that like three people were applying to the same mayor for a proclamation. Or you know, two different groups of people were trying to light up um, a monument in Houston or something. So we were like, maybe if we have everyone a little more coordinated and at the state level, like really uh, interacting with each other so we can avoid duplicating and then just expand the efforts rather than three people applying to the same mayor, why don't we apply to three different mayors or you know, the governor, the senator, and the mayor or something like that. So, um, so far where we have the groups, we're doing uh, quarterly events where we have um, expert speakers. Sometimes we're just gonna have social events just because I think it's, as patients, sometimes just nice to meet each other in a relaxed setting and there's no, you know, there's no lecture or sitting in a chair for an hour or two listening, just sort of getting to hang out. Um, other times we'll have fundraisers and then awareness month events. So focusing on what you can do, um, it's really easy to kind of get stuck in a rut and you miss like, oh, I can't do this anymore or my friends can do this and I can't do that. And I think it's natural to have those feelings and you know, be okay with yourself feeling like that, but don't get stuck in that place. Really focus on what you're good at, what you can do. Um, and I remember when I was fully like bedridden, I was, I felt like lost, like who am I as a person? I could, I'm, a, I'm an attorney and I couldn't work anymore. So I'm like, if I'm not Lauren Stiles, the attorney, like what am I, just some lady who lays on the couch? Like it was really like my, my identity had been taken from me. So um, I had a friend who suggested that I make this list called my can do list and it sounds completely cheesy, but I did it, I made this list and the things I could do when I was bedridden were like things you would never do if you had a lot of you know, busy things to do. <laughs> but I was like, I'm gonna make a photo album. <laughs> like, and just, you know, reminding yourself that you can still be a productive person and that you can still accomplish things and set goals for yourself. Um, so medications. This is the part I wish Dr. Sandroni was here for, but I'm, I'm pretty good on this. And I'm sure some of you are gonna have questions that I can't answer. So if you do, that's okay, um, we try to generally get the questions answered by uh, one of the doctors on our board, and then we'll um, you know, put it up on Facebook or something like that to the extent we can. So the different classes of medications that are most often used in POTS are blood volume expanders. Florinef, otherwise known as fluticortisone, <coughs> is one of the most common. Um, this is something that um, can drop your potassium levels, so it's probably good to uh, get your potassium checked every few months if you're on floor enough and anytime you change your dose. Some patients have to take it with a potassium supplement. Question? Um, have there been issues with moving from cortisone and kidney stones? Um, not, groups, not that I'm aware of, um, but I can pop a question over to Dr. Sandroni about that. I think the doctors would have talked about this. They would, they would give this as a warning in their articles about POTS because they're very cautious how they treat us. So um, I haven't heard of it, but um, DDAVP as uh, desmopressin is another drug. Uh, Dr. Grubb has written about this a bunch. It um, helps you uh, retain your, your uh, salt and fluids a little bit better. IV saline we talked about before. Um, you know, it definitely helps reduce the tachycardia, but long term as like your regular course of treatment is not a good idea. And it can actually um, alter your renin angiotensin, your natural hormone system that regulates your blood volume. It can be impaired if you're on frequent saline. I learned this the hard way. Before I was running Dysautonomy International, I was a confused, newly diagnosed patient. And my local doctor noticed that I felt better on saline. So she was like, oh, why don't I just send you home with a pick line? <laughs> so I had a pick line for um, three months until I got a blood clot and I was getting two liters of saline a day and that. And then I got a chest port um, and the chest port slid out of place and went two chambers into my heart and had an emergency surgery to remove it. So I loved getting the saline, but then I didn't love what happened to me because I was getting it through an access device. So I would just be really cautious about that. I know how much it makes us feel better, but um, you know, ask yourself, is it really worth it for the risk? Um, and we've had patients who got blood clots and died, and it wasn't from POTS. You know, they died because they had a blood clot because they had a chest port. Um, so just really be careful um, when you talk to your doctors about that stuff. The, some of the doctors at Vanderbilt will use saline 
um, like for special occasions, like if you're getting married and you have to stand up during like a two hour ceremony, they'll, they'll give you a liter of saline as like a sympathy saline. <laughs> like, uh, or for graduation day or something big like that. Um, vasoconstrictors, uh, midadrine. Oh, sure. How do you know if you have low So if you have POTS, you can pretty much assume that you have a, some aspect of low blood volume. It's, it's come up in the research as a very high percentage of patients. Um, and so we, we basically treat everyone as if they do. Uh, Midadrine is a vasoconstrictor. Um, it works for some patients, usually works better for patients who have a neuropathic component to their POTS, like a little small fiber neuropathy with their POTS. Octreotide is um, a drug that has to be delivered subcutaneous injections every six hours, so it's not really an easy treatment, but it is uh, an alternative that's available. So Sudafed PE, not regular Sudafed, is uh, phenylephrine. And this is not something you want to use long term. Like you wouldn't, it's, it's very similar drug to midadrine. But if I put it on the list because if you're like on vacation and you forgot your midadrine or you run out, phenylephrine will probably do a good trick. You can get it at the local drugstore and it, it helps you just similar to the way midadrine does. But it's not a good long term option. Now I have high pressure on top of all of this. Yeah. So So uh, phenylephrine is not regular Sudafed. It's a totally different drug. It's a vasoconstrictor, much like midadrine. Um, so if you have high blood pressure, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take midadrine because you don't want to constrict your... You on it? I was on, uh, on Florida, and my ankle swelled up, so they took me off of it and put me on the midadrine. And you have high blood pressure. Yes. Well, I can't give individual medical advice, but that's pretty unusual. <laughs> um, and they think... Yeah. On, on tilt table testing, about a third of POTS patients will drop their blood pressure on a tilt, but not enough to be orthostatic hypotension. About a third remain normotensive, and about a third will have an increase in blood pressure on tilt. These tend to be the hyperagenergic patients, but you can, there's actually such a thing as hyperagenergic orthostatic hypotension. So that's, you know, mighty confusing, right? <laughs> um, so. Uh, that's why we say don't pay too much attention to the um, subtype labels because there really is a lot of overlap. Um, I have a question about that? Sure. Which I was thinking fairly early on. Is there a form of POTS where the heart rate drops? No. So um, there are people who have POTS who have overlapping neurocardiogenic syncope, maybe 20 to 30 percent of POTS patients. So neurocardiogenic syncope is also known as vasovagal syncope. It's pretty common in the general population. Most people who have this would faint maybe once or twice in their life, and it's not really debilitating for them. But there's a smaller subset of neurocardiogenic syncope patients who have frequent syncope and you know, debilitating uh, quality of life uh, symptoms from it. So neurocardiogenic syncope right before um, the blood pressure drops that triggers the faint, right before the blood pressure drop, there's a, a pause in the heart rate or a very um, significant slowdown in the heart rate. But it's not a long-term, like uh, the low heart rate doesn't last for days. It's a momentary thing, sudden drop in heart rate, sudden drop in blood pressure, sudden passing out patient. Um, but then they recover. So if someone has persistent bradycardia, then they shouldn't be diagnosed with POTS. They probably have a, um, some other kind of autonomic problem going on. Um, so heart rate control, doctor, uh, cardiologists love to throw beta blockers at us. Um, lower doses tend to work better than higher doses. Um, the, some of the doctors have their preferences on which beta blocker, but the Vanderbilt group says, you know, low dose propranolol is probably the best option, 20 milligrams or lower. Um, if you take too much beta blocker, it drops your blood pressure and gives you more orthostatic tachycardia. And fatigue is also an issue with beta blockers. Ifabridine is a drug that was approved in 2015 for congestive heart failure, and so it's not F none of these drugs are FDA approved for POTS, but Ifabridine is it's a very new drug, so a lot of cardiologists are not familiar with it yet, um, and it's being used off-label to treat POTS. It's a funny channel receptor blocker instead of a beta receptor blocker, and it's actually called a funny receptor because when they looked at it under a microscope, it looked funny. 
Um, <laughs> who knew that lab people have a sense of humor, right? Um, and uh, it doesn't, if you take Ivabradine, uh, when it blocks the funny receptor, it actually doesn't drop your blood pressure. Uh, it does something else. It, it gives you a little bit of uh, flashing in your retinas because besides your heart having a lot of these receptors, uh, your retinas do as well. So that t side effect tends to go away um, in a few weeks when people start this drug. Um, Mestinon, some of you may know about. That's a drug that sort of boosts the parasympathetic nervous system and can help uh, some POTS patients reduce their tachycardia. Uh, Droxidopa, otherwise known as Northera, is a drug that was approved a year or two ago for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. It's used off-label in a subset of POTS patients. Dr. Grubb had a study on this, and um, it was maybe about a third of POTS patients that benefited. And we think that if there is a subset of POTS patients that benefit from this, it's probably the same sub that subset that would um, respond to midodrine. And droxidopa costs like $30,000 a year. So try minadrine first, which is still not a cheap drug, but um, probably a better thing to try first. Some of the doctors will use stimulants like Adderall or Provigil for brain fog. Um, these are like ADHD drugs, and they give you a little more tachycardia. So if your heart rate is already high, it's going to make it worse, potentially. Okay, well, there are a lot of other experts, and they disagree on things all the time. Uh, trying to get my doctors on the board to sit around the table and agree on anything. We're lucky they agree on the name of POTS, um, <laughs> which we don't agree on. We wish we don't like the name, but you know, it's. I know a lot of people, people steer away from it. Yes. So. Um, a lot of women with POTS uh, have a worsening of symptoms right before their period or during their period. And this is because um, natural hormone changes uh, change your blood volume. It changes the uh, laxity of your uh, blood vessels. Um, so it's not uncommon to have worsening symptoms. So some patients go on birth control pills to um, minimize the number of periods they have per year or minimize the, um, the hormone flux that happens. Chronic pain can actually make dysautonomia symptoms worse. You'll get more tachycardia, you'll be more uh, sensitive to the overstimulation that a lot of us have if you have chronic pain. So managing chronic pain is really important. The doctors recommend non-opioid drugs to do that whenever possible. Um, iron infusions, Mayo had a study going on recently. We know from prior research that um, a lot of POTS patients have an iron storage deficiency. So it's not just low iron, but they don't really store it that well. So Mayo was just doing um, a, a small clinical trial um, looking at using iron infusions in POTS patients. It's not out yet, but we know a lot of POTS patients, when they correct their iron issues, they do uh, feel some benefit, which makes sense. And then some forms of autoimmune POTS um, are known to respond to IVIG. This is a really new concept. So if you have Hashimoto's and POTS and you go to the doctor and say, I want IVIG, they're probably going to say no, because there's really no research proving that Hashimoto's uh, would respond to IVIG. Oh, sorry, intravenous immunoglobulin. It's, a, it's an immune modulating drug that's used in a lot of neurological autoimmune diseases. Um, I happen to be on this drug for, because I have Sjogren's syndrome and POTS, and Sjogren's is known to respond to IVIG. Um, but it isn't for everyone. And it has a lot of um, pretty scary side effects, so you don't take it it's not like taking a beta blocker. <laughs> um, for the birth control pills, um, I'm on long-term antibiotics, and I know antibiotics are really good for the birth control pills, but I don't know if it's still, would it still help? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I can find out. Okay. I, would, I would think that it's still going to have a hormone-regulating effect on your body, but it just may not be enough to prevent the pregnancy, which is why most people would be taking birth control pills, right? So there's a question in the back. Oh, I was just going to say what you said. It's okay. about the protection of the pregnancy, but it still helps with Okay. So um, all of these drugs are off-label. Sometimes it's really hard to get insurance to cover them. That's another reason we need research, even though, like, you know, most of us know that Florinuf kind of helps a lot of POTS patients. We really don't have solid research data proving this. And um, floor enough is cheap, so that's not one people have a hard time. But some patients have a hard time getting midodrine covered. Um, so we need 
basic research on POTS to be able to let people get access to the drugs that will help them. There are studies going on right now on Ivabradine and um, Droxidopa in POTS. So hopefully those will have good results and that you could use that then to make your insurance company pay for it if you need it. Um, so um, avoid starting multiple new medications at one time because our patients, if you're a patient, you already know this, we're very sensitive to medications. And if you get a side effect, you want to know which drug it came from uh, and decide if it's worth it or not to stay on that drug. So don't start three new pills at once. Um, the doctors, especially the Mayo doctors, are, you know, people show up on 18 different pills uh, when they go to the Mayo rehab program. And they're pretty good at paring those down and really staying on what's really essential. Um, because you can get a lot of complications when you're taking so many different pills at once. You start to lose track of what's the side effect and what's my actual disease process. Um, I was on 4 f for uh, over six years. And I had to stop it last fall because I got bit by a bat and had to get the rabies vaccines. I mean, you can't, like, the only thing weirder than having pots and sugars is I got bit by a bat. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to get the rabies vaccines, and I was pretty terrified because I had to go off my Sjogren's meds, too. Um, any immune modulating drugs, you have to go off them to get the vac uh, rabies vaccines. So I went off everything cold turkey, and I was like ready for the onslaught of fainting and orthostatic stuff that I thought was going to come back. It didn't. And I was like, I can't believe I've been on floor enough all this time, and I didn't really need it. I mean, at, at some point, I did need it when I started it. I really did need it. But along the six-year, seven-year journey, I, something changed in my body and I didn't need it. So if you've been on some of these drugs for a long time, try to taper down. See if you still need it. You know, it's, it's, I can't tell you how freeing it is to not have to be taking pills like 10 times a day because I'm only on uh, immunoglobulin right now. I don't have any other meds, which just feels good. Um, and POTS changes over time too, regardless of you know, your drug tolerance or response. Your, disease, your illness <coughs> itself may change. So tips for talking to your doctor. I know um, in the beginning, I would walk into a new appointment and have like great hope for like, you know, this doctor's going to figure me out. And I'd give them my 100 symptoms, and they'd be like, whoa. You know, <laughs> that's a really good way to get a doctor to think you're crazy if you tell them all your symptoms at once. So when you go into a doctor's appointment, think of the top three things that you need to address at that appointment. You can always have a follow-up appointment to talk about the next three symptoms, you know? And, and usually with POTS, if you're addressing the primary problems, the other symptoms will improve too. There's a lot of like, you know, um, if you have severe GI dysmotility and you fix that or you address it to a point where it's better, that's gonna help the orthostatic symptoms because part of the reason you're orthostatic when you have a GI problem is that you're not getting enough fluids because your GI tract is, you know, it's making it uncomfortable for you to drink three liters a day. So you address, you know, address the top three things at each appointment. Save your giant binders for your house or keep them in the car. Don't bring them into the new doctor's appointment. That is one way to scare the doctor. Um, you have a question, go ahead. Right. I would say to that doctor, feel free to do a bait and exam right now. And I'm not arguing with you here, yeah. I, I would, you know, I've, I think all of us have encountered doctors that don't believe us or don't believe prior doctors. Um, I mean, I got diagnosed with Sjogren's at Cleveland Clinic, and I went to a rheumatologist in Manhattan, and they didn't believe it. And I was like, what? Well, <laughs> this is Cleveland Clinic. It's pretty, you yeah. know, grade A. Yeah, and so. I, um, I'm to the point where I'm deteriorating health life. I don't go to the doctor or to the ER unless it's desperate. Yeah. I've gone out cold 10 times a day, even on right. vacation. I think, uh, in general, the ER is not a good place to address POTS. And I think yeah, we've I, all done it, probably. Um, it when we end up in the ER, it's because our chronic management care has failed. Mm -hmm. So we need to get better at that and get our doctors, our, our follow-up regular doctors, to help us 
get better managed. Um, and I think the ERs, you know, they don't, they're, they don't care that you're lightheaded. You're not dying, get out of here. You know, that's their mentality. They're there to save people's lives and put limbs back on. <laughs> so we're, I think a lot of times the ERs view us as annoying because we're, you know, we want saline um, and we feel awful and we complain about a lot of symptoms, but they don't see anything really I hear, wrong. I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, right now, you just, I'm just beyond exasperated with the medical system right I know. Now I think we're all right there with you. <laughs> right. So when I say, when, when doctors say that, um, that statement that, um, you know, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras, they, they teach young doctors this because young doctors tend to latch onto every rare disease. That's what they remember because the rare diseases are more interesting. So they want them to think about the common diseases first. But when I lecture uh, to doctors, I have a slide at the end that says one out of ten um, one out of 10 Americans has a rare disease. So if you're seeing 10 patients a day, or you know, more than that, you're seeing a person with a, you're seeing a zebra at least once a day in medicine. Um, and the other thing to think of, so POTS is not a rare disease. We are not zebras. EDS, uh, so the formally defined EDS is probably rare, but the broader joint hypermobility is definitely not rare. Um, so I say, you know, yes, think of, one out of 10 people you're seeing is a zebra. And then also, think of a horse, of, sometimes there's a horse of a different color. Remember from the, um, the Wizard of Oz, the <laughs> horses that change the colors like as they walk through the Emerald City? Potts is a horse of a different color. Maybe we're turquoise, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we're something that the doctors don't think they see every day, even though they probably do. Um, and they just have to, you just have to find someone that you can work with. You don't need the world's best Potts expert, but somebody who will sort of... Yes. Well, I think doctor shopping is great. If you're going to spend a lot of time shopping for a car, probably a good idea to spend a lot of time shopping for the person that's going to help you maintain your health. It's my health is more important than my car, so doctor shopping is okay with me. Doctor shopping, looking for drugs and stuff like that, is is sort of the negative connotation of that term. Um, so let me just get back to the slides. Um, and part of our frustration when doctors don't know what to do with us is you know, we get mad, like how do you not know about this? So many people have this. You have to realize they have no training on this in most medical schools. You can have a brilliant neurologist who literally got an hour on the autonomic nervous system in medical school. It's not necessarily their fault that they don't know about it. So what we're doing as an organization and what we want all of you to be part of is educating medical professionals, getting them the facts, getting them, showing them the research that exists. And over time, that will lead to systemic change. And it already is. I mean, even though it may not feel like it at the moment, we're already seeing uh, more doctors contacting our organization, asking for resources. Uh, I think I have a patient. Where can I send them? Who can I talk to for a second opinion? And it is changing. It's just really slow. Um, so I have to finish at 7.30 because they need the room. So we have just a few minutes. Um, this is our contact info. Dysautonomyinternational.org is our website. But curepots.org is also our website. It like, redirects to the DI site. It's a lot easier to remember if you're a POTS patient. So that's a, that's a good one, curepots.org. We're also on Twitter, Facebook. Um, most of you are probably on there. And um, our email list where we have, um, we send out a monthly update. We don't spam people because we don't have time to write all those emails, to be honest. We're, we're mostly, um, we're all volunteers. We have one employee in Washington, D.C., and everyone else involved with Dysautonomy International is a really dedicated volunteer. So I would encourage you, if you want to be involved, you know, let us know. We want to work with you on doing awareness month events, running re regional support group meetings, running physician education programs like the one we had earlier here today. Um, so thanks so much for your time, and um, I will hang out outside for a little bit, but I know we have to sort of leave the room at 7.30, so thank you very much. Thank you.